Hello and welcome to Parkside Evangelical Church. We welcome you in the name of the Lord Jesus. My name's Rory McClure. I'm the pastor of Parkside Church. Parkside's located in Little Hampton in the southeast of England. We're an independent evangelical church. We love the Word of God. We love the people of God. We love the Lord Jesus Christ. We also love our mothers. This is Mothering Sunday, and each and every one of us owes our life to a faithful mother who gave us birth, and hallelujah for that. And so we want to give thanks to God for those mothers and we want to give encouragement and blessing to all of our mothers and encouragement to those who are mothers as well. It's a tough job and they need our blessing and encouragement as well. But we've come mainly to worship God. Whether you're locked in home because of the COVID crisis, whether you're struggling to find a church, we hope and pray that you're blessed as you spend this hour together with us. We'll be hearing from God's word We'll be thinking about that really important question, who is on my side? Well, the good news is we have the Lord Jesus Christ on our side. So join me now as we worship him. Our call to worship comes from Psalm 113. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. From this time forth and forevermore, from the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, who is seated on high, who looks far down on the heavens and the earth. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes, with the princes, of his people. He gives the barren woman a home, making her the joyous mother of children. Praise the Lord. It's a wonderful psalm that. It's a reminder of the blessings that mothers can be. A wonderful psalm for this, our Mothering Sunday service. But we're now going to worship our God who's given us life. He's our great Father and we love and adore him as well. We're going to begin our worship as we sing Join all the glorious names. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we want to praise you, O Lord our God. 
We thank you and praise you, Lord Jesus Christ, that you are worthy of our worship and our adoration. Bless us and help us, dear Lord. Send down the power of your Holy Spirit to lift our hearts into heaven so that we may behold you, so that we may know that you are good, so that we may receive your strength and your blessing. We pray, dear Lord, that you would bless your holy name, that you would make the name of Jesus precious to us from this time forth and forevermore, from the rising of the sun to its setting. May the name of the Lord Jesus Christ be praised. We thank you and praise you that he is seated at your right hand, high above all nations, and his glory is above the heavens. We thank you and praise you that there is none like our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who is seated on high, who reigns in power and glory. We thank you and praise you, dear Lord, that you sent your Son to become one of us, that he raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit sit with princes, and with the princes of your people. We thank you and praise you, dear Lord, that when we were lost, you helped us to sit in heavenly places. We thank you and praise you for that glorious adoption that we have through Jesus Christ. We thank you also for our mothers. We thank you that it was you who gave them life, you who gave them wombs, you that helped them to conceive, you that helped them to get through the pains of childbirth. And we thank you and praise you for the blessing that they've brought in our lives. We just ask for your blessing on them now, Lord. We pray especially for the mothers in our congregation. Lord, please give them strength to cope with all of the stresses and all of the worries of being a good and faithful mother. And so, Lord, we praise you and worship you. Amen. We're going to respond to God now in an attitude of thankfulness and joy. As we sing this, our next hymn, My Heart is Filled with Thankfulness. Will you join me in prayer? Our God and Father, we praise you and worship you. We thank you and praise you that you are good, kind and merciful. 
We thank you, dear Lord, that you bless us with an abundance of good things. We thank you for our mothers. We thank you for our lives. We thank you for our homes. We thank you for our wives. We thank you for our children. We thank you for all of the blessings that we have. Lord, we just ask that you would help us and strengthen us. Because in the midst of all of these blessings, we know life's sorrows as well. We ask, dear Lord, that you would give strength and peace to us. We ask, dear Lord, that you would give hope for the future, that you would give purpose and meaning, that you would bless and strengthen us in the midst of all of our aches and pains and problems. We want to pray especially for those who are struggling with uh, ill health at the moment. We pray that they would receive the medication that they need. We pray, dear Lord, that they would receive strength from you. We ask, dear Lord, for your blessing and healing on them, especially on those who are going through great physical pain. We pray for peace of mind for those who are struggling mentally. We pray for consolation, that they would know the love of Jesus Christ and that their brothers and sisters in Christ would give them encouragement, give us wisdom to know what we can do to be a blessing to them. Lord, we pray for all those who are struggling at this time, who are uncertain about the future, who are struggling to keep their businesses going, who are struggling to make ends meet, who are struggling to use their skills and talents to your glory and who are frustrated through this lockdown and through all of the other problems. Have mercy on them and give them your peace, dear Lord. We thank you that the children are all back at school now. We pray for your blessing and safety on them. Lord, we pray for wisdom for our government as well. Please help them to know how to deal with this lockdown. We pray especially for this massive uh, um, debt that the nation has risen. Uh, Lord, we pray that there would be good and sensible ways to pay that back. Lord, please deliver us. But Lord, all of these things mean nothing unless we come back to Jesus. So revive your church again, Lord. Send down your Holy Spirit. Bless this YouTube service. Bless all others like it. Draw more and more people back into the life of this church. I pray, dear Lord, that more and more people would feel confident about coming in to the presence of God, that we would be able to restore public worship, that we would be able to restore the public singing of your praises. Oh, Heavenly Father, hasten that day. May it be a glorious day when we all rejoice, when we all gather around your table and feast again on what you have provided through the bread and the wine. May we come and meet with Jesus. Oh Lord, please restore us to our rightful worship again. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to come to God's word now. We're going to do a reading. Actually, we've got two readings this time. Uh, we've got a very complicated passage in Hebrews, and to try and give you the context and the background for that, I'm going to give you two readings now. And our first one comes from Genesis chapter 14. Let me give you the background and the plot. Abraham has been called. Abraham has been given a promise that he would be a blessing to every family on earth, and yet that promise has not yet been fulfilled. He's been wandering through the uh, promised land. He's has, he has his nephew with him, Lot, and uh, they're, they've grown prosperous. Their flocks have grown. More people have joined them and sought protection with them. And yet there's conflict as well. And so they've parted their ways. Lot has decided to settle on the lush and fertile plains of Sodom and Gomorrah. He's on the other side of the river in the valley of the river Jordan. But Abraham has continued to follow God. But this is a time of great, great conflict when many warlords are attacking each other, where they gather up other warlords and they band together and they just go raid towns and villages and other small little nations and tribes. And so we're reading from Genesis chapter 14. Our God and Father, bless the reading of your word by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. In the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Arioch, king of Eliezer, Jadola Omer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of Goyim. These kings made war with Bera, king of Sodom, Birsha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, Shemeber, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar. And all these joined forces in the valley of Sidim, that is, the Salt Sea. Twelve years they had served Jadola Omer, but in the thirteenth year they rebelled. In the fourteenth year, Jadola Omer 
and the kings who were with him came and defeated Rephaim in Ashtaroth Karnaim, the Zuzim in Ham, the Emin in Sheva Kirathayim, and the Horites in their hill country of Seir as far as El Paran on the borders of the wilderness. Then they turned back and came to En Mishpat, that is Kadesh, and defeated all the country of the Amalekites and also the Amorites who were dwelling in Hazanon Tamar. Then the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adma, the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar, went out, and they joined battle in the valley of Sidom with Chedorlaomer, the king of Edom, Tidal king of Goyim, Amraphel, king of Shinar, Arioch, king of Eliezer, four kings against five. If this was Tolkien, we'd call this the battle of the five armies. But it's not Tolkien, it's not fantasy. This is real history, real people out plundering and raiding and killing one another. Now the valley of Sidon was full of bitumen pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled. Some fell into them, and the rest fled to the hill country. So the enemy took all the possessions of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions and went their way. They also took Lot, the son of Abram's brother, who was dwelling in Sodom, and his possessions, and went their way. And then one who had escaped came and told Abram the Hebrew, who was living by the oaks of memory, the Amorite, the brother of Eshcol and Anar. These were the allies of Abram. And Abram heard that his kinsmen had been taken captive. He led forth his trained men, born in his house, 318 of them, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. And he divided his forces against them by night, he and his servants, and defeated them, and pursued them to Hobah, north of Damascus. Then he brought back all the possessions, and also brought back his kinsman Lot with his possessions, and the woman and the people. After his return from the defeat of Chedorlaomer, the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom, went out to meet him in the valley of Sheva, that is, the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was a priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram, by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. That's our first reading. That's from Genesis chapter 14. And that helps us to make a little bit more sense of Psalm 110. Psalm 110 is often quoted in the New Testament, a very, very important one, because it's ultimately fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, Jesus even challenges the Pharisees of his day, and he says, how could David have somebody more important to, than himself? You could even translate this first opening verse as, uh, the Lord, or Jehovah, or Yahweh, says to my Lord, to my boss, Abraham, sorry, David, in other words, was saying that he had somebody more important that he addressed as Lord. And so David, as he wrote this, was addressing that issue. Someone in the future would be so important in his life, he would regard him as his boss, his Lord, his head, his superior. And yet this boss, this Lord, would speak to the Lord God Almighty, Yahweh, the creator of heavens and the earth, the covenant-keeping God. Psalm 110, a psalm of David. The Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, the covenant name of God, Yahweh. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power, in holy garments, from the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. He will drink from the brook by the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. 
And maybe you're slightly disturbed by verses 5 and 6, <clears throat> that he will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter the chiefs over the wide earth. And yes, that does reflect exactly what Abraham had to go through, that time of tremendous chaos where warlords were plundering and raiding one another. And that's what David himself had to live through as well. But we also need to remember that this has a spiritual interpretation. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22 says, But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. So when this psalm is speaking of Zion, it's speaking of the heavenly Zion. We also need to remember that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, and against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. And so Jesus is waging a constant spiritual battle to overcome our true enemies. And so these words we can take on and we can pray and sing with full passion and conviction because they are fulfilled in Jesus. Jesus himself would have sung this. He would have sung it unaccompanied in his local synagogue. He would have sung Psalm 110 on a regular basis. And it would have meant an awful lot to him because he knew that he was the living fulfillment of that psalm. So what I'd like us to do now is sing Psalm 110. I found this lovely version. Uh, there's some denominations like the Reformed Presbyterian Church in North America that sing nothing but psalms. But this is one of their versions of Psalm 110, a real blessing for us. And in case you're wondering about the tune, the tune is, should be familiar to you, to you because it's the tune that, for those of you who know the hymn, This Is My Father's World, it's what we often sing to, This Is My Father's World. But will you join me now as we sing... The Lord said to my Lord, Psalm 110. The Lord said to my Lord, Sit here at my right hand Until I make your enemies A footstool for your feet The Lord from Zion Send your scepter in his strength With mighty power show your rule among your enemies Your people freely come Throughout your day of power From morning's dawning Holy robes, your youth are like the dew. The Lord has sworn an oath and will not change his mind. In the order of Melchizedek, you ever are a priest. The Lord has your right. Shatter kings in wrath. Among the nations he will judge and fill them with their dead. Yes, he will smite and crush chief men in many lands. And from the wayside brook he'll drink. And therefore lift his head. If you've been following this video series, you'll know that a few weeks ago we read Hebrews chapter 5, and there the writer to the Hebrews said this Jesus was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. We have much to say about this, but it's hard to explain because you're slow to learn. Well, the writer to the Hebrews assumes that in the last couple of chapters, his original listeners would have caught up and they would have been quick to learn because now he's ready to tell them more about Melchizedek. And thankfully, you and I have caught up as well. We've been brought up to speed. We've looked at Psalm 110. We've looked at uh, Genesis chapter 14. And so hopefully with that background, this chapter will make an awful lot more sense. So will you bow with your head with me as we pray 
and we ask God to speak to us through his word. Our God and Father, send your Holy Spirit that we may understand this difficult passage of Scripture. Help us to understand its relevance. Help us to be encouraged by it. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to turn to Hebrews chapter 7. We're reading a lot of Hebrews chapter 7, but I'm just going to read a couple of verses before Hebrews chapter 7, starting at verses 19 and 20, the last two verses of that to set the context for the opening sentence of chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 19 says, We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain, where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the most high God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to him, Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. He is first, by translation of his name, king of righteousness. And then he is also king of Salem, that is, king of peace. He's without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God. He continues a priest forever. See how great this man was, to whom Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of the spoils. And those descendants of Levi who received the priestly office have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people, that is, from their brothers, though these also are descended from Abraham. But this man, Melchizedek, who does not have his descendant from them, the Levites, received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who has the promises. This is beyond dispute, that the inferior is blessed by the superior. In the one case, tithes are received by mortal men, but in the other case, by one of whom it is testified that he lives one might even say that Levi himself, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, though he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek, rather than the one named after the order of Aaron? For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. For the one of whom these things are spoken belonged to another tribe, from which no one has ever served at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah. And in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. This becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek who has become a priest, not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. For it is witnessed of him, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. And it was not without an oath, for those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath. But this one was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. Now that is a difficult passage of scripture. It's difficult just reading through it, but I want us to understand it. So I'm briefly going to read through it again, and I'm going to give some uh, explanations as we go along, trying to help you to make a little bit more sense of it. And then when we've understood that, we'll then think about why is this relevant to us? What encouragement, what strength, what hope can we draw from it in our own individual lives? So starting from chapter 7, verse 1. This Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the mo most high God, Abraham, met returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. So we've already read that in Genesis chapter 14. He is first, by translation of his name, a king of righteousness. And then he is also king of Salem, that is, king of peace. He's without 
father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. Now, this is a difficult idea because it's divided Christians. Some people believe that this is referring to the Lord Jesus Christ pre-incarnate. Just as the angel of the Lord could appear to men, so also the Lord Jesus Christ perhaps appeared as Melchizedek. And given the fact that Melchizedek is said to have neither father nor mother nor genealogy, neither beginning of days nor end of life, then you would think, yeah, that would describe the eternal Son of God. However, it does say that he's resembling the Son of God. He doesn't say that he was the Son of God. So I believe that what's happening here is that he's saying that he's not, he doesn't have his genealogy or his parentage recorded for us. If you read through the Bible, if, especially the Old Testament, you'll discover that one of the tedious, most difficult parts to get through are the endless genealogies. And those genealogies in the, under the Old Covenant system were really important because the only people that could worship at the altar of God under the Old Covenant were the descendants of Levi and no one else. You could be born into that. You didn't have to be appointed to it, but you could be born into it. And by right of birth, you could serve at the altar. And yet Melchizedek doesn't have his lineage recorded for us. This was an extraordinary privilege. This is something that God himself must have conferred directly on Melchizedek. He granted that right and privilege. And so Melchizedek doesn't just represent an individual. It represents an office, an office of being appointed a priest directly by God himself. See how great this man was, to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the spoils, and whose descendants of Levi received the priestly office, have commandment in the law to take tithes from the peoples, that is, from their brothers, though these are also descended from Abraham. So that was the Old Testament system. The Levites had to support their work and their families through their service at the altar, and they did that by taking a tithe, a tenth, from all of the Jewish people and nobody else. But this man, Melchizedek, does not have his descendant from them. But this man, Melchizedek, does not have his descent from them, from the Levites. He received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. It's beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. And so what he's saying is that Abraham had to humble himself and acknowledge that Melchizedek had greater spiritual authority than even the father of the Jewish people. In the one case, tithes are received by mortal men, but in the other case, by one of whom it is testified that he lives. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand, you are forever in the order of Melchizedek. David was aware as he wrote Psalm 110, that there was this heavenly presence of a Melchizedek-like king reigning. And having received that honor from God the Father himself. In fact, he goes on to say that one might even say that Levi himself, who received tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, for he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. So in other words, uh, the DNA that was uh, in flowing through Abraham's veins, was ultimately carried on by direct descent to the tribe of Levi and to the Levitical priests. And in Abraham, they were bowing to the superior ministry of Melchizedek. Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, and it wasn't, the Levitical priesthood had many flaws, and the whole history of the Old Testament is, testifies to there was many, many flaws. For they, under it, the people received the law. What further need would there have been need for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek rather than the one named in the order of Aaron? In other words, what was David talking about in Psalm 110? He was saying that there would be this person coming in the order of Melchizedek, a priest like him. Why would that be needed if the Levites in the Old Testament were what God needed to bless the nations. 
when there's a change in priesthood, there's necessarily a change in law as well. And hallelujah for that. There has been this glorious change. We've been set free from the constraints of the, tes of the old covenant law. We're no longer bound to its many institutions and difficulties and heartaches. And uh, 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 we are set free and have direct access to God himself. For the one who spoke of these things I've spoke belonged to another tribe. So he's talking about David here. David, the author of Psalm 110. And no Judite from which David was descended ever served at the altar. It's evident that our Lord was also descended from Judah. And in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. This even becomes more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. And again, as he meditates and thinks and prays and sings Psalm 110, it becomes more and more clear to him how there is a priesthood far, far more important than the Levites and the temple that they served at. For it's witnessed of them, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Hence, an indestructible life, an unending life without, end, without um, beginning, without end. For on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing imperfect. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced, through which we draw near to God. And so, it was not without an oath for those who were formerly became priests were made such without an oath. The, priest, the Leviticus priests, as I said, simply became priests because they were born into the right family, a bit like being born into the royal family or being born an aristocrat. It's something that happens by birth, not by uh, being, uh, earning it. But this one, Melchizedek, was made a priest with an oath by the one whom it said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever. And so this is something that came directly from God himself. And Jesus is the living fulfillment of that. And therefore, he is the guarantor of a better covenant. And hallelujah for that. As I said, this is a difficult passage. So I just want to introduce us to some wonderful, comforting truths. I don't know if you've ever felt to yourself, who is on my side? You felt lonely, you felt isolated, you felt frustrated, you felt that everybody was against you. Well, imagine what it would have been like to have been Abraham. Abraham had his nephew abandon him. He went over to live in the plains of Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, he had uh, heard of the reputation of those cities. He was concerned about him, but he was a grown-up. He had to be left to his own devices. And he found himself in a strange land surrounded by warlords, murdering and killing each other. Abraham must have felt very, very isolated at that stage. And yet he found strength. He was blessed by God. He was able to raise a small army, 318 people, our text told us. But he was by himself. But he was never by himself because he had the ever-living God with him. And in the midst of that, he knew that he needed an ally. He knew that he needed to worship the true God in the land that had been promised to him. And there he met Melchizedek, a priest of the Most High God. I don't know if he anticipated him being there. I don't know if he knew of his reputation. I don't know if he was surprised to find him when he arose there. But when he met Melchizedek, he could see that this man is my spiritual superior. He needed an ally. He needed somebody on his side. In the midst of all of these difficulties, he needed Melchizedek. And so, Melchizedek was on Abraham's side. Melchizedek acted as a prophet. Our scripture told us in Genesis 14, Blessed be God Most High who has delivered your enemies into your hand. He had prophetic insight into the status of Abraham and he had prophetic insight it's a knowledge that Abraham's enemies were his enemies and were also the enemies of God. And so this man was definitely a prophet, but he's also a priest. It's very unambiguous in our text. He was a priest of the Most High. 
of God Most High, Genesis 14 tells us, and in Hebrews 7 it says that he continues to be a priest forever. So he has this status of ongoing priesthood. And finally, he was a king. And again, he was king of Salem. He was king of righteousness. And then he's also called king of Salem, that is king of peace. This man had tremendous authority and power. And to be a king in the ancient world meant having the courage and the ability to lead men into war. For some kings, it was wars of aggression and theft and conquest, but for a righteous king, a, a, a righteous king who sought peace. It's also the duty of good kings to be able to defend the people entrusted to him by God from those predators and those other kings and looters. And so this man must have had to also have been a, a warrior. He must have been a tremendous man of courage and had the ability to protect it. It's interesting as we read Genesis chapter 14, none of those other kings, all of the nine armies could have ganged up and they could have tried to attack Salem or Jerusalem as it came to be later known. They could have tried to attack Melchizedek. But I can only assume that they knew of his reputation and that they knew there was no point in trying to mess with a man like that. But thankfully for us, Jesus is our Melchizedek. Jesus comes to us. And just like Melchizedek served bread and wine, so thankfully Jesus comes to us as our priest. And he meets with us around the table. One of the greatest sadnesses for me of the lockdown has been the fact that we haven't met around the Lord's table. We had it right at the beginning of this year. It's been a very long time since we've met together as a, uh, as a whole church, but a small number of us turned up to church at the beginning of the year. We managed to uh, have the bread and wine together and celebrate the Lord's Supper. However, we miss it. At the beginning of April, I'm hoping in the second week of April to have a public communion again. We'll reinstitute that again. Hopefully by May, more of you will be able to come out and we'll be able to have a large number of people gathering around the Lord's table. And then by June, oh, what a blessing it will be when we can meet with God around the Lord's table again. But Jesus is on our side. And this is the good news I want to, you to take away with us. Because no matter what you're going through, you need to know that Jesus is on our side because Jesus is our prophet. Jesus speaks to us. And every time you open your Bible, you hear the words of Jesus speaking to you. Read your Bible, take comfort, guidance, and instruction from it. Secondly, Jesus is our priest. He meets with us around the Lord's table, as I've just said, but he also intercedes for us continually. When you're feeling prayerless, know that Jesus is praying for you. When you're praying and you're not sure what the will of God is, know that Jesus is taking your prayers and praying the prayers that are according to the will of God. When you're feeling hopeless, know that Jesus hasn't given up on you. He continues to pray for you because Jesus is our priest. And best of all, as a priest, he's able to show his wounds. He's able to offer them up before his heavenly Father. And he's able to say, it is finished. The price has been paid. This child, this dear child who feels so guilty and ashamed of what he or her has done. My blood has atoned for them. And Jesus wants you to know that and accept that forgiveness for yourself. And finally, Jesus is our king. And as our king, he reigns, he gives us his law. He speaks to us with authority. He tells us how we ought to live. He says to us, if you love me, keep my commandments. But he also battles our enemies. Jesus is our divine warrior. Yes, he's prophet, priest, and king, but as a, the office of his, ki of his kingship, he also wages war. Jesus is a divine warrior, and that's exactly what uh, Revelation tells us. Right at the end of Revelation, it says, I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dripped in blood. And the name by which he is called is the Word of God. 
and the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses, and from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty, and on his robe and on his thigh he has na a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus is this glorious divine warrior. And as we were reminded in Ephesians 6, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We don't have to fight the battles that Abraham uh, had to fight. Praise God. Praise God that we're living in a time of peace and stability. But we have a constant spiritual battle that we need to be waging. We need to be constantly in prayer, knowing that Jesus is waging that heavenly battle. And so no matter what you're battling with, whether you're battling with doubts or aches and pains, whether you're battling with uh, fear and frustration, whether you're battling with anxiety or worry about your loved ones or about your future or about mistakes of the past, Jesus is waging battle on your behalf. You are not alone in this. Jesus is with you. Jesus is going to strengthen you. Jesus will guide you because he's your prophet, priest, and king. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you. We thank you and praise you that you are alive. You brought Jesus back to life. And we thank you that we have life in Jesus. We thank you that he's redeemed us. He's restored us and he's given us encouragement and blessing. And so, dear Lord, please bless us now. Help us to love you and to worship you and to trust you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to come to God now and our final song. This is a, another new song to us, but it's some, one that I found really, really moving. It's very, very powerful. Uh, the style of singing is probably a little bit different from what you're used to because uh, they're just so full of passion. They're almost shouting out these words. Uh, this is a style of singing in, the, in America uh, called shape note singing, or uh, um, it comes from the, uh, harp of, um, the sacred harp, I think it's the name of the hymn book. It's a very distinctive style of, hymn, uh, of singing, but just enter into that visceral, gut-felt passion for Jesus and know that Jesus lives. Your Redeemer lives. So will you sing me, with me this last song, I know that my Redeemer lives.
That was quite a passionate song, wasn't it? That was extraordinary. I hope and pray that we'll be able to use that again. A good reminder there that Jesus is interceding for us as well. But praise God for that. Now let's say the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Thank you again for all of those of you that every week you faithfully click the like button, you try to say something on the comments section as well, and you've subscribed and everything else. All of these things are so helpful because it helps YouTube to recommend the video to other people, other people get to see it, and then they too subscribe. And so this ministry is growing. It's good to know that other people are learning about Parkside Evangelical Church here in Littlehampton. My name's Rory McClure. Just remind you about that. And if you ever want to join us, we are meeting on Sunday mornings. Uh, we still have public worship, especially now that the restrictions are being opened up again. But do phone on a Friday if you possibly can. Contact us through the web page, which is Parkside, Evan Parkside Church. Google it in Littlehampton. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to see you again soon. Until next week, may God richly bless you. Amen.